Professor Matthew Fisher is currently an adjunct instructor of economics at Rochester College and Ivy Tech Community College and a former adjunct instructor at Northwood University. In 2010, he graduated from the University of Detroit Mercy with a Master of Arts and Economics degree. He also holds a, Masters of, a Master of Humanities degree from the University of Dallas. Uh, it's my pleasure to present Mr. Uh, Professor Matthew Fisher uh, with his uh, presentation, Wages, Productivity, and Employment is Raising the Minimum Wage a Good Idea. Thank you, Professor Weglars, and thank you, Professor Verizer, uh, for inviting me to give this talk uh, today. I have fond memories of these symposia, um, and I'm glad to see that they're back on. It's an honor to be asked to contribute, and I thank all of you for coming today. Recently, there has been much discussion of raising the federally mandated minimum wage. The most recent uh, increase was passed in 2006 and took effect over a three-year period during which it was raised in three separate increments. Currently, the federally mandated minimum wage that an employer can pay an employee is $7.25 an hour if the worker is younger than 18 years old and $7.40 an hour if the worker is 18 years or older. Over recent months, the current administration has continuously proposed raising the minimum wage to $10.10 per hour. I would like to take my time here this morning uh, to explain why I think raising the minimum wage is a bad idea. Actually, I'll go even one step further than that. I will argue that any legally mandated minimum wage, whatever its level, is contrary to the common good and ought to be abolished outright. To begin, I'd like to give a brief overview of neoclassical price and wage theory. From there, I will uh, consider the consequences of legally established price floors and the effects of minimum wage laws on low-skilled workers. It's likely that most, if not all, of the people in this room are familiar with supply and demand. But for those who aren't, or for those who need a quick refresher, allow me to take a couple of minutes to review the basics. The law of supply says that there's a positive relationship between the price of a thing and the amount of the thing that will be, will be brought to, to the market by sellers. That is, holding everything else equal, if the price of the thing rises, so too will the amount available for sale. Conversely, if the price falls, sellers have less of an incentive to sell, and accordingly, they bring less to the market. To help frame the discussion, let's posit that the thing in question is labor hours. We can see here the positive relationship between the amount of labor hours that workers are willing to bring to the market and the wage they earn for those labor hours. As the wage rises, so too does the willingness of workers to supply labor hours. But what about the demand for these labor hours? The law of demand tells us that if all other things stay equal, then as the price of the item rises, the amount of the item demanded by buyers will fall. So in this case, contrary to what we just saw with supply, we can see an inverse relationship between quantity and price. As the wage rises, buyers of labor, that is employers, are less willing to hire laborers, but as the wage falls, employers are more willing to hire laborers. So let's put the supply of and demand for labor hours on the same graph. Right away, we notice that something interesting has happened. We can see that there is a single wage at which the amount of labor hours demanded is exactly equal to the amount of labor hours supplied. This means that everyone who is willing to work at this wage can find a job, and every employer who is willing to hire a worker at this wage is able to. This is the only wage at which this condition holds. I will call this wage the market wage. This is the wage that will be naturally established through the voluntary interactions of the buyers and sellers of labor hours in this market. However, there is much more we can say about the establishment of wages in free markets. You'll know what I mean if you've ever spent enough time around or reading neoclassical economists. Once the subject turns to wages, you're very likely to hear or read such economists using the term marginal revenue product of labor. To make matters even more abstruse, if you spend enough time around Austrian economists, you're likely to hear about the discounted marginal revenue product of labor. So what does all this mean and why is it relevant to the establishment of wages? The marginal revenue product of labor is commonly defined as the change in total revenue earned by a firm that results from employing one more unit of labor. To see how this is relevant to the establishment of wages, let's work through an example. Suppose that I am a small business owner 
selling general home improvement services, and I hire laborers to staff my firm. Let's also suppose that I hire you as a laborer, and you work one hour for my firm. Suppose also that by the value of your productivity during that hour, the revenue that accrues to my firm increases by $30. In this case, we would say that the marginal revenue product of labor is $30. Simple enough. Now, what about the discounted marginal revenue product of labor? It's the same as the above, but discounted by the social rate of time preference, which is the natural market interest rate, over the total period of production. But what does that mean? Well, let's suppose that the project in which you are working will not be completed for one year. The discounted marginal, product, uh, marginal revenue product of labor will reflect the revenue generated by your productivity during the labor hour, which is $30, minus the rate of interest over that year. Austrian economists have argued that free market wages will tend toward the discounted marginal revenue product of labor. So if we assume an interest rate of 10% over that one year, your wage will tend toward $27. To see why, let's go back to our labor market where the wage paid to the laborer and the quantity of labor hours employed is de determined by the interplay of supply and demand. Let's stipulate that for some reason, whatever it is, for some reason, this market wage is below the discounted marginal revenue product of labor. Karl Marx, for instance, famously argued that as long as capitalists, entrepreneurs, and landowners earn interest, profits, and rents, workers do not receive just compensation for their labor. Indeed, in the capitalistic system diagnosed by Marx, labor is necessarily exploited by the propertied classes. I do not have the time here uh, today to discuss Marx's flawed surplus value theory, but suffice it to say that even today, the belief that laborers are systematically exploited by capitalists and entrepreneurs, and that free market wages are chronically lower than they ought to be, owing to the malice of conniving and de deceitfully clever employers, is a very common belief. Indeed, the popularity of this belief lends itself to supportive minimum wage laws, which are an attempt to remedy this injustice. Sadly, however, it is unfortunately common for advocates of minimum or labor market intervention to hold their assumptions about markets and about greedy people ruining things for everyone else only up until the point where those assumptions become inconvenient, at which point they are silently dropped. Now, why do I say this? Well, let's think about our employee-employer relationship a little more so. In the example I gave it a moment ago, your discounted marginal revenue product was $27. But let's suppose that the market wage for your labor hour, and thus what I pay you to complete the work, is only $20. That gives me a pure profit of $7 for that hour. $7 of pure profit on $20 of cost is not all that bad a rate of return. It's 35% to be exact. But the crucial question to answer is this. For how long will this situation last? I submit that the present state of our employee-employer relationship will last only as long as it takes for another entrepreneur to recognize this profit opportunity and offer you a higher wage. This is what I mean about interventionists holding their assumptions only up until the point where those assumptions become inconvenient. By definition, in a free market, there is freedom of movement into and out of markets. If my firm is making outsized profits by underpaying its workforce, then someone else has an incentive to jump in and compete away those profits. We cannot simply assume that markets don't remunerate laborers at, la at fair rates because of the supposed greed of employers. On the contrary, the desire of the next entrepreneur to also make money will give him or her the incentive to make you an even better offer for your labor hour. This other entrepreneur wants to get a piece of those outsized profits too, after all. If the competitor entrepreneur is allowed to enter the market and bid for your labor, the consequence will be a bidding war. And what's the logical terminus of this bidding war? The competitors for your labor hour have an incentive to bid your wage all the way up to the discounted marginal revenue product of your labor hour. So let's look at the effect of that bidding war in this labor market. You can see that the consequence of the increased bidding for your labor is a rightward shift of demand which results in a higher wage for you. So in contrast to the belief that labor is chronically and systematically exploited by free market processes, neoclassical and Austrian economists understand that entrepreneurs, precisely because they want to maximize profits, have an incentive to bid wages up to the point where the cost of employing a labor hour is equal to the marginal revenue produced by that labor hour.
To put it in technical economic terms, if a monopsonic buyer of labor wishes to take advantage of the decoupling of its average cost and marginal cost of labor curves by remunerating the quantity of labor hours it purchases at a wage below the discounted marginal revenue produced by those labor hours, then pari passu, it creates an incentive for other profit maximizing firms to enter the market and bid for those labor hours at a higher wage. The firm that enters the market will increase the options for workers and thus augment the, el the elasticity coefficient of the supply of labor to the initial firm, closing the gap between the firm's average cost and marginal cost of labor curves, thus eliminating the firm's ability to pay workers less than the value of their productivity. So if we're going to posit that markets are full of supposedly greedy and conniving entrepreneurs and capitalists, we must also recognize that the incentive structure facing all of these individuals, that the way, the, the incentive structure facing all of these individuals ensures that the wage you earn will tend to reflect your discounted marginal, discounted marginal revenue product. We simply cannot arbitrarily drop our assumptions halfway through the analysis if we want to make sense of the reality of labor markets. And if the interventionists would hold their assumptions until the end, they would clearly see that in markets where firms are seeking to maximize profits and the free entry of competition is continuously allowed, the tendency is for labor to be re remunerated in accord with the value of its productivity. Okay, so that's the theory. But let's suppose that you are either unconvinced by this analysis or feel very strongly that laborers, particularly laborers making relatively low wages, are one way or another paid too little for their, for their efforts. Rather than start your own business where you can offer the exploited laborers higher wages, you decide that you're going to run for a U.S. congressional seat on a platform of raising the minimum wage. Let's say that you do so and your run is successful. Now as a very important person, you are in a position to make a real difference and give back to the community by making rules for everyone else to follow. So on your first day in office, you get together with Nancy Pelosi and Lindsey Graham and John McCain and Harry Reid and introduce legislation in both the House and the Senate to raise the federally mandated minimum wage. Now let's say that your gang of five is proposing to raise the minimum wage from $7.40 to $10.10 an hour. And let's suppose that this legislation passes in both houses. The president signs the bill and you're the toast of DC. Your civic career is off to a wonderful start with such a uh, politically popular bill to your name. But what does the minimum wage law mean for low-skilled labor markets in the first place? It means that they are imposed upon by what economists call a price floor. That is, this legislation imposes a, price, a legal price control that disallows the wage for low-skilled labor from falling to its natural market price. As you can see, with a legally mandated minimum wage that is above the natural market wage, the quantity of labor supplied will be greater than the quantity of labor demanded. As a matter of fact, the effect of the price floor is to reduce the quantity of labor hours employed, but increase the willing supply of them. This means that there will be a surplus of labor in this market. In other words, if the government decides to impose a price floor in the labor market, but the discounted marginal revenue product of labor holds constant, then the necessary consequence is unemployment. But do we actually see such an effect in low-skilled labor markets after increases in the minimum wage? How would we know? Well, for a very long time, economists have used teenagers as a proxy for low-skilled labor. It should be obvious why. If you've ever been one or have known one, you'll know that, on average, teenagers are not very productive. <laughs> So what happens if we look at the effect of increases in the minimum wage on teenage employment rates? This graph was created by one of my favorite bloggers, Dr. Mark Perry, who is a professor of economics at U of M Flint. Professor Perry has taken the difference between the teenage unemployment rate, which is the percent of teenagers who want full-time employment but are unable to find it, and the overall rate of unemployment, and shown the correlation between this number which is represented by the blue line and measured on the left vertical axis, and nominal increases in the minimum wage, which is represented by the red line and measured on the right vertical axis. Obviously, there's a clear correlation in this data. As the minimum, ri as the minimum wage rises, so too does the gap between the teenage unemployment rate and the overall rate. This suggests that teenagers, that is, low-skilled laborers, were and are adversely affected by increases in the minimum wage in just the way that our simple supply and demand analysis would predict. Unfortunately, although I think Professor Perry's intuition is correct here, this graph has a couple of shortcomings. First of all, didn't the economy experience a big recession during this time as well? Wouldn't we expect teenage unemployment to be affected by that? 
maybe even more so than adult unemployment. And if the recession did affect the employment prospects of teenagers more so than adults, maybe the recession and not the increase in the minimum wage accounts for the larger discrepancy in unemployment rates. How would we know? One additional shortcoming. The graph represents the nominal minimum wage and not the real minimum wage. That means this graph doesn't show the minimum wage in inflation-adjusted terms over the selected time horizon. This too can obscure what's really going on. But let's see if we can't find other evidence of what our supply and demand model predicts. Let's look at the teenage employment rate over the last 60 years and see what happens to it during recessions as well as periods of minimum wage increases. The blue line in this graph represents the teenage employment rate. It goes as high as 50% in the late 1970s and as low as 25% in the early 2010s. The orange shaded bars represent periods during which the minimum wage was raised, and the blue shaded bars represent economic recession. The brown bars represent periods of overlap between recession and minimum wage increases. I realize that this is a little convoluted, but bear with me. This graph shows that in six of the last seven minimum wage increases, the teen employment rate trend fell. That is to say that whatever the teen employment trend was doing prior to the minimum wage increase, its rate of increase was less or even negative after the hike. We see that yes, the most recent increase in the minimum wage was overlapped by the recession, but there are also minimum wage increases in 1955, 1961, and 1967 that are not correlated with economic recession, and each clearly shows a trend change for the worse in the teenage employment rate. This trend becomes even more readily apparent when we consider the inflation-adjusted national average minimum wage. This graph shows two things. Number one, the federal minimum wage in inflation-adjusted terms, that's the blue line. And second, the national average minimum wage in inflation-adjusted terms, that's the red line. Because certain states have passed laws that mandate a minimum wage higher than the federal minimum wage, the national average minimum wage is higher than the federal. Now, what if we look at the inflation-adjusted national average minimum wage and employment numbers for Americans aged 16 to 24 over the last 20 years? The creators of this graph call it the minimum wage demand curve. Here we see a clear inverse relationship between the number of employed Americans aged 16 to 24 and the national average minimum wage. With a higher minimum wage, the number employed is lower, and with a lower minimum wage, the number employed is higher. This is exactly what we would expect to see given our supply and demand analysis of the low-skilled labor market. The creators of this graph excluded the bubble years of 1998 through 2001 from their regression analysis, which is represented by that sloping uh, red line there. They excluded those years because they argue that the minimum wage demand curve shifted right during those years. Once that economic bubble popped, we were back on the old demand curve. The year 2013 is represented by the red box in the lower right corner. Moreover, we see the same trend in the unemployment rate for 16 and 17 year olds in the UK during their most recent minimum wage hike. This increase in the minimum wage did not correspond with an economic recession in the UK. Further, if we look at Western Europe as a whole, simply checking each country's minimum wage against its jobless rate, we see a correlation even more striking. On average and at the median, those countries with no minimum wage have a jobless rate less than half as high as those countries with a minimum wage. Certainly there are many other factors at play in all of these countries, but it is safe to say that those countries with higher rates of unemployment have more interventionist friendly governments in general, and the favored interventions of these polities are, like the minimum wage, not typically conducive to healthy and fluid labor markets. Now, there are certainly economists uh, who disagree with me, but I believe that the theory and the empirical data are quite clear that minimum wage laws cause higher rates of unemployment in low-skilled labor markets than would exist otherwise. I believe that minimum wage laws are indefensible for this reason. Now, to give my objection to the minimum wage slightly more context, I would like to share with you an extended quote from one of my favorite documents, the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. I realize that not everyone here is Catholic, but the following passage is directly relevant to any discussion of the minimum wage, and I would be surprised if anyone here disagreed with the sentiment or logic of the argument. 
the compendium states, work is a fundamental right and a good for mankind, a useful good, worthy of man because it is an appropriate way for him to give expression to and enhance his human dignity. The church teaches the value of work, not only because it is always something that belongs to the person, but also because of its nature as something necessary. Work is needed to form and maintain a family, to have a right to property, to contribute to the common good of the human family. In considering the moral implications that the question of work has for social life, the church cannot fail to indicate unemployment as a real social disaster, above all with regard to the younger generations. Work is a good belonging to all people and must be made available to all who are capable of engaging in it. Full employment, therefore, remains a mandatory objective for every economic system oriented towards justice and the common good. A society in which the right to work is thwarted or systematically denied, and in which economic policies do not allow workers to reach satisfactory levels of employment, cannot be justified from an ethical point of view, nor can that society attain social peace. An important role, and consequently, a particular and grave responsibility in this area falls to indirect employers, that is, those subjects, persons, or institutions of various types in a position to direct, at the national or international level, policies concerning labor and the economy. The planning capacity of a society oriented, oriented toward the common good and looking to the future is measured also and above all on the basis of the employment prospects that it is able to offer. Excuse me. The high level of unemployment, the presence of obsolete educational systems and of persistent difficulties in gaining access to professional formation and the job market represent, especially for many young people, a huge obstacle on the road to human and professional fulfillment. In fact, those who are unemployed or underemployed suffer, suffer the profound negative consequences that such a situation creates in a personality and they run the risk of being marginalized within society, of becoming victims of social exclusion. In general, this is the drama that strikes not only young people, but also women, less specialized workers, persons with disabilities, immigrants, ex-convicts, the illiterate, all those who face greater difficulties in the attempt to find their place in the world of employment. Now again, to the extent that minimum wage laws cause unemployment, I believe that they are indefensible. Now I do in fact share the sentiments of those who wish to raise the minimum wage. After all, I too want to see higher wages for all of us, most especially the poor. But the sad reality is that we cannot create wealth through legislative fiat any more so than King Canute could order the tide to halt its rise and turn back. My argument for how wages are legitimately increased may be partially inferred from the preceding, but an explicit treatment will have to wait for another day. For now, I thank you for your time.